Wednesday night, we're entering into the book of Thessalonians. The Lord talks about his triumphant return and his coming. We're entering into his mind and his heart. Not to figure out the date and time. I tell you, you could, many people might try to figure out the date and time. The question is, are you ready when he splits the eastern sky? We find out whether we're playing games whether we're hiding in our own living rooms and doing our own thing, we'll find out if all of our luxuries and pleasures, if we were ready. You were given one life to live, one life to prepare, one life to get ready for His coming. Holy Spirit should be bringing conviction to you about preparing that life and not hiding it. If you hide it, what good is that? Not supposed to put the light under a bushel. Not supposed to be an individual off in some corner somewhere instead. We're supposed to be in the Lord's house, seeking Him with our whole heart, preparing our mind for Him, preparing for His return. The hope of His return is what helps us live a life that is right before Him. Scripture says man can justify anything. That means we figure out religiously of how we can get safe in our own little living room, in our own little spot, that I don't have to go do anything else except what, the, what I want to do and call that the Lord, or whether that's on vacation and call that the Lord. I ask you, when the thunder roars and the sky splits, the decision that will be made as to whether you're ready or not, those who are looking for him will see him. A little prelogue on what we're going to be studying coming Wednesday nights for the next few sessions. And as you know, we go line by line, precept by precept, tracing even the Greek and the Hebrew roots of what God is saying when he said, I am coming, when he said, be prepared. And what he says when he says there's a whole bunch that's not prepared and they will be left. I hope and pray that you're not one of those that is left because of resistance, one of those who are left because you're religious, one of those who's left because you're wicked. Instead, I hope and pray that you take this as a sovereign word from the Lord. He is coming. Get ready for his coming. Never forget he's coming. Expect he's coming. He's going to come. It may be this afternoon. It may be this week. He's going to come. And he has a lot of questions for you when he arrives. Be ready. Be prepared to answer those questions. Live your life before the Lord God because nothing else counts. I was sharing with my granddaughter the other night and she was saying... I don't understand this, all this stuff. And I said, well, honey, it's like we're a cartoon and we're just a flat character in that cartoon. And everything around us is just kind of hand-drawn on the wall and everything around us is going to pass away. 
And what really counts, the real world, is the kingdom of God. The pursuit of Him. The knowing Him. There's where the real furniture's at. There's where the real clouds are at. There's where the real cities are at. There's where our bodies will be made anew and afresh from us being some little cartoon character. And we were just given a measly little bit of time to make a decision. Do we want to be a part of the family of God or do we not? That's our only reason for the existence on planet Earth. It's not for our pleasure. It's supposed to be for God's good pleasure. It's supposed to bring Him pleasure. We're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And with that in mind, part of that working out our salvation with fear and trembling, we must learn to communicate with Him on His terms, not ours. At His time and His choosing, not ours. Whenever the children of Israel were gathered and they came to give sacrifice, it was always in the morning and in the evening. He designated the time. The people did not designate the time. Sometimes there was special assembly. Once again, God designated the time. My whole point is, is your whole life should be focused on, is this the time, Lord? Because he might say, right now, I should go down to the church and pray. You know, we have people come down here and pray in the middle of the day. We have people praying for people who are praying, who are pre- praying for people who are praying. Did you catch that? <laughs> prayer, prayer is the beginning. But how can you pray if there's no God there to answer? If you really don't believe God answers. I mean, you know, when he, I was a good Baptist starting out about this tall. We, we prayed general prayers. Just generally, Lord, if you want to do anything, that's okay with us. <laughs> generally, we pray that, Lord, there's lots of sick amongst us. Uh, if you want to heal, that's okay with us. I mean, general prayers. How many general prayers did you see answered when you were coming in to your theology about God? Not too many. And the reason being is because there's not much faith in that. There's not much trust in that. There's not much hope in that. All the prayers I see answered in Scripture are the ones that are very specific. Ones that are in the heart and originate in the heart of Jesus. When he prayed to his Father, the Father stopped heaven to listen to him. And he was trying to relay how to commune with the Father, how to pray to the Father, how to get in his presence. Now, I can tell you that, uh, I don't know if any of you ever climbed into the cockpit of the space shuttle, it's quite complex. If you flip the wrong button, it could get real exciting. Mm-hmm. Everything could go up in smoke. How many of you have ever climbed into a cockpit of a, a plane before? I can tell you the cockpit of a little a Cessna 150 <laughs> is totally different than that of uh, some of the special planes that we have out there that the military has. I had the joy one time of being at NASA, and uh, they had, I don't know, some grand thing going on down there. And uh, with their grand thing, they actually had available a flight simulator for an F-20. They had to pay some money to get in that thing, and you only got five minutes in the seat. It's the complete reality of being in an F-20. I watched and stood in line for an hour and a half to be able to get in this thing. And while I was watching, because they had uh, cameras on the person who's trying to get it started, you know, some people are down there going, nothing happens. They don't know how to start the engine. They play with the controls. The ailerons maybe move a little bit. Canopy, they push the wrong button, the canopy opens. (laughs) Well, they got problems. They're not going anywhere. They never got off the runway. And I was, I love fighter planes and have studied them and all that stuff and flown quite a bit when I was younger and flown some helicopters and stuff. And most of the instrumentation I could recognize because I'm getting to see it on camera before it ever happens, you know, and all the mistakes they're making and they can't even get off the runway. And I'm thinking, man. You know, and I'm waiting and waiting. But I'm learning as I'm waiting. I'm learning, oh, that's what that button does. Why? Because I see their mistake. But I knew the general mechanics of what was there and how to read all the gauges and dials and all that stuff. 
after waiting about an hour and a half, my mom, she was there, and she was sitting in a chair. I pulled her up a chair, and so I'm just waiting in a line. And, 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 and she don't want to get on this thing. And, of course, it's not a two-seater, so <laughs> she's not going to get on it. And I finally make it inside, and I know the second they close the cockpit, once I buckle up, that's when the time clock starts, and I have only five minutes to experience what this thing can do. And I'm telling you, if you're flying a little Cessna 150, it's basically, once you get up in the sky, it's like a, a slow egg beater. You're just... I mean, you just feel like you're on a marshmallow float and not going nowhere very fast. Now, I'm in a plane that, that can do Mach 6, you know. <laughs> and how can you get it there? How can you... And, 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 and if I'm going to do it get it finally in the air, I'm going to have to taxi. I watched some guys taxi down the runway. You're cleared left on runway 117, you know, and, you know, they're, they're wasting all their time and all that stuff, and they finally get around to the runway and make their turn. And I think it was one guy out of about 200 that finally got it off the ground, you know. And I'm thinking... You know, I want the experience of everything that there is. And so I'm in my mind, okay, this does this, this does this, this does this. And I've got all the things down already inside me of the, of the feel of what to expect and all that stuff. And I climb in there and buckle up and I immediately flip over and flip it up. And now it's in the hangar. I blow the back of the hangar out, come out of the hangar. I'm coming. I get on the tarmac, which is well, the, 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 the actual sidelines of where you taxi down to get to the end, end of the runway. This thing has 150,000 pounds of thrust. I'm at the very end of the tarmac, and I said, I want to be airborne. That thing. I'm not wasting my time on the runway. I meet a lot of kids. Christians that waste their time about getting airborne in the spirit. And there are some specific instructions and directions that tell us, believe God, do this, walk in the spirit, take the nature of Jesus Christ on, put on the belt of truth, put on the helmet of salvation, put on all of these things. It means get all those things on if you can get those things on, and if you have just a little practical experience, why, the baptism of the Holy Spirit can launch you into the stratosphere. I kept this thing pedaled to the metal, and I shoot up to 50,000 feet, level off, do a barrel roll, turn upside down, and I'm trying to look and see where's something, where's something, because I know they got something down there. I just don't want to be in the air. I want experience. I catch a city, I flip back over, and I'm headed down towards that city. I see their gun emplacements and all that stuff, and, and I'm... And I literally drop down into the middle of the city, cut down one of the streets, and, and I'm thinking, I can't die. I cannot die in this thing. I might as well see what it can do. Now, am I going to be a pancake on the wall or what? Now, I'm thinking our Christianity is supposed to drive us to the point that we want experience with God. And we're willing to risk everything that there is to have that experience with God. And stop being mamby-pamby about it and grab the power of God, the Spirit and the Word, and launch into His presence. Now, what can get us there? What's the beginning process? It's beginning to hear Him. He said, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God, and that word rhema means Faith comes when we hear the voice, and the actual word in the Greek is not God the Father, it's God Jesus, it's God the Son, it's God the Messiah. Faith comes when we hear Jesus speaking and saying, do this, do this, don't do this. And we can't have faith from any other source except that in our soul. But how does it begin? It begins by us hearing. It begins by us talking to Him, learning how to talk to Him, and learning how to talk to Him on His terms. And I can tell you the Hebrews knew how to talk to him and in his terms they came in and they, yes, my Lord, yes, they realized you're the living God. They didn't approach him like we crazy maniacs do sometimes. Up, oh, out of the way, rip the curtain, I'm here to see Dad. I got, hey, I want this, this done, this done, this done. I'm telling you, you're not going to get to hear his voice if you go in to him that way. 
This is a God that requires fear. This is a God that requires reverence. This is a God who angels tremble at His mere presence. And if we're not trembling in our heart, how are we going to get audience with Him? We won't know how to approach this awesome King that rules the universe. And you may come in sideways in the wrong way and catch Him in the middle of one of His judgments. And it's not going to be a pleasant scene. So shouldn't we learn how to do it the right way? That's where prayer comes in. That's where we learn how to earnestly pray. Because our communication with Him is what starts all of this. My communication, when I started flying, I was 16 years old. I was still in high school. And I was going down and taking evening flight school that lasted six hours each evening for the entire summer. And, and then, of course, you get your practical application going out flying. But I had to learn about hydraulics. I had to learn about all the cables that are in there. I had to learn about the wings. I had to learn about the aileron. Then I had to study weather and become a meteorologist. I said, man, I don't want to be a weatherman. I just want to fly. I just want to fly. Don't forget, our whole purpose in learning the Word of God and acquiring the things of the Spirit is to have experience, revelatory experience in God's presence so that He becomes the most real thing there is on planet Earth. And we, in the midst of that, for the first time, see something that's not a cartoon. We see something that's real. We see a kingdom illuminated by Him, ruled by Him. We see substantial beings that are so far beyond us all of those experiences are waiting for the Christian that will only adhere to the pathway that he has laid down to get there. He wants you airborne. He doesn't want you tied up on the ground with a bunch of rules and regulations. However, there are rules in coming to him. The rules and regulations that keep us from coming to him make us religious, make us feel good about ourselves, make us feel, well, I've got all kinds of knowledge. I can do this and I can do that. But can you fly? Can you get into His presence on a consistent basis and keep the high enough altitude that you can catch the glimpses of what's going on in the heavenlies? Most Christians I talk to, even filled with the Spirit, have had, okay, well, I had this happen, and then I have had this happen years later, and then I had this happen. And it's just a few isolated experiences rather than one solid, continual flight of being in His presence of hearing his voice. Everything the apostles did and the early church did, they all were being instructed by the voice of the Lord. The scripture says they all came to the same knowledge, the same understanding, the same revelation. But yet they were Gentile church. They didn't have the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. How did they come into something that we're just flopping around like a fish out of water trying to find. How did they maintain it? How did they live in it? To the point that Jesus Christ would come and stand in their midst and orate to them and give them the instructions of their life through the power of the Spirit. The first thing they had in their heart of, Oh God, you're real and I want you. I desire you. I need you. Seeing that God is real is paramount in us pursuing Him. And seeing our need... Part of our problem is we don't see our sin nature. We're trained in man's philosophy that has to do with, well, it's subjective. Man's not really bad. Well, I have you to know that the scripture says everything in man is bad. (laughs) Everything and every thought in man is evil is what the scripture says. But yet philosophy of men says that we're not really bad. Now you may do a couple of bad things, but that you're not bad. Well, if I'm not bad, I don't need Jesus Christ, and I don't need a Savior, and I don't need a God, and I can do what I want. There's the problem with that philosophy. I have no need for God if I can do it on my own. The philosophy of this world is basically you can achieve and do all things on your own, and you don't need God. The philosophy of God is you were born dead. You were born dead. You know what a stillborn baby is? Have you ever seen one? I've done a funeral for a stillborn baby, and it is, it'll tear your heart out. Something that could have had life doesn't. Something that could have had breath, there's none there. And you think about the hopes of the future that child could have had and all the relationships that child could have had. 
Adam and Eve lost that for us. For we had no communing with God. That we were cut off. Man died when he took the download from that tree. The Spirit of God that was in him no longer lived in man. And the only thing that lived on was the mind and the body. And he lost his ability to commune and be in the presence of the Lord. And when Jesus shows back up on the scene thousands of years later, he wants to reconcile us back to become a creature filled with the Spirit. Now, what good is it for you to be filled with the Spirit if you're going to live your life for yourself? God's got a lot of questions for you. You say, okay, you got my Spirit, and you spoke in the angelic language, and you prophesied a few times, but why didn't you live your life for me? Why didn't you walk in the Spirit, live and move and have your being? And He's got some serious questions. Now, we need to get those reconciled. And how we can begin to reconcile those is approaching Him honestly. But we can't approach Him honestly unless we see, I need you. I have no forgiveness unless you're willing to forgive me. I have no righteousness unless you can provide that right now. Because what I did earlier... I'm unrighteous. What you, even the thoughts that you had. How many of you had bad thoughts this last week? <laughs> oh, we got one honest man back there. The rest of you are liars and all going to hell. <laughs> bad thoughts emanate and surround us. That's not just the enemy. That's our nature. But the nature of Jesus Christ is wanting to be installed in you through his presence and through the power of the Holy Spirit if Jesus is here living in me, do you think he has something he wants to do for the Father today? Come on. Does he have something he wants to do for his Father today? Now, who won't let him use his body? I say, wait a minute, I'm not real comfortable. I had my evening all planned, my afternoon all planned, and a lazy boy recliner and football game and crocheting. Oh, I don't crochet, that's Jackie's thing. And he said, what do you mean? Man, it, it's flight time. Get off the controls and let me have the controls and let me take this body into God's presence. I got things to do for him. What are you doing standing in the way? And I'm supposed to be communing with him enough that I can kind of savvy that. Because if I don't savvy that, all of a sudden the communication grows quieter and quieter and quieter, and he withdraws a consciousness of his presence. And withdrawn his presence, he withdraws a consciousness. If I'm not going to listen, why will he speak? Now I get all dry. I think I'm okay, and I'm, well, okay. That surge of wanting to go do something for God, I, 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 he, he probably just wanted to test me, and now I can just do my thing and watch football and, and enjoy myself. No, he just withdrew because I wouldn't let him have my body. So I want you to know mainly that prayer consists of us coming to the Lord, realizing he's God, and absolute surrender to him of here, O Lord, I am your servant. I want to give you a couple examples of that, and Samuel is a good place to start. Hannah, a woman that really connected with God, cries out to God for a child. She has a husband, her husband has another wife named Panay, and Panay's had, I don't know, several sons. She's not had any children, and I tell you, if you were a woman and you didn't have a child back then, you were the scourge of the earth. Why? Because you're the one that uh, was God's personal carrier of the divine nature of, of developing man on earth. And if you weren't, it, it smacked that you were cursed by God. Matter of fact, every woman that was barren, it said, and God opened her womb, right? And God opened her womb. Well, Hannah, she's just absolutely being shamed to death by her rival. And it says a rival was really giving her a hard time, that you're basically cursed of God. But her husband really loved her, and her husband would go in and offer special sacrifices. And she one day, her husband had set up a special meeting with Eli, which was the high priest at that time. And the special meeting consisted of, okay, I'm going to bring you my 
huge bull, and we're going to barbecue it. <laughs> Will you be there, Mr. Priest? And, and of course, we'll bring some cash and change, because Eli, he was, uh, he was pretty crafty about wanting the things of the world and not serving God and not training his children to serve God, and they did some evil things before God. They did so many evil things before God. You know what God said? He said, you've done, and your kids have done so much evil before me. That never in your lifetime will I ever accept a sacrifice for your sins. Is that a serious statement? I don't know of anywhere in history that God ever said he wouldn't accept a sacrifice. But he's saying that to the chief priest. I will not accept. I will never forgive you for what you have done. You can offer bulls and all that stuff. I will not accept anything from you. And as a result, of course, that bloodline perished. But before it perished, Hannah, she's throwing this big party, and her husband is, and uh, she's thinking that God really exists. The tabernacle's right there, and they're right next to it, and they're having this, this feast. And right there in the midst of it, she all of a sudden starts praying. And she's blubbering, crying, praying, and crying out to God, Oh, God. Would you do something? You're the only one that can cause me to conceive. And her words are not being formed out here because they're inside. Her words are so deep, they're guttural groans of, Lord, I need you. I need your help. Eli, he was kind of ticked off and said, What are you doing drunk at the table? You're not supposed to be soused on beer and wine and she said oh no 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 please not I'm not I, w I would never do that that's not you know, I'm broken hearted because I don't have a kid and I'm just she was praying her lips were moved her lips were just quivering crying out to God and God heard her prayer and as a result in her prayer she said Lord if you only give me a child I'll give him back to you now that's a big statement the essence of everything that she would love and everything she would behold, she's offering that back to God for his complete service. Sure enough, she becomes pregnant. And as a result, Samuel is born. And as soon as he's weaned, she takes him to the tabernacle and gives him to Eli as a servant. As just a servant. He's not a member of that household to be a priest. He's not a member of that particular tribe that held the rights to be a priest. And Eli and his sons were so lazy, they stuck a robe on this little boy, a linen cloth, so that he could go in. And he's the one that tended the interior of the tabernacle. The lights had to be lit precisely at 6 o'clock, right at dusk, when the sun tipped right below the surface. Someone had to be there to light the menorah. Someone had to attend those lights all night long, and precisely when the sun crested, they had to be snuffed out. Someone had to be there. Guess where Samuel slept at? Right there in that room. Right there at the feet of the menorah to take care of him. He's a little kid doing all the priestly duties, but he still doesn't know God. As a matter of fact, the last prophetic voice in Israel and in the world ended 200 years prior to this with Deborah, the prophetess. There hadn't been a word from God that concerned the nation in 200 years. It's a dry, dry time for the word of the Lord. In the midst of that, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, you'll find that about Hannah. In chapter 2 and verse 18... It says, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a board wearing a linen ephod. And each year his mother made him a little robe. Can you imagine that? She comes down to shadow where he's at and makes him a little robe and puts on him. And you can imagine seeing your, your, your little son in a priest robe. And he is the one that's doing everything because the other priests are too lazy. He continues that before the Lord. Not knowing it's before the Lord, he's just serving Eli. He's just doing the religious things. But he saw his mother's heart. 
he knows that God answered his mother's prayer. He has a heart for God, a heart to hear. And there's not been anybody that's had a heart to hear for 200 years. Anybody that has a heart to hear, God will want to speak to. But for 200 years, that's a pretty hard society that they don't want to hear from God. The boy Samuel, and, 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 and note this, that God said whenever the king would go astray, he would put certain curses upon the nation. Whenever the priesthood would go astray, he would put certain curses upon the nation. But what did he do whenever the people went astray? Do you know what the scripture says? He said he gave them children for kings and women for the religious leaders. He said, fine, you don't want to follow me? I'm going to give you women for your religious leaders, and I'm going to give you children for kings. I, I find that just absolutely fascinating. Now, here we have a boy. He's not a king. But the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. How was he ministering to the Lord? Under a man of God. The man of God still wore the ephod. The ephod still had the Urim and Thummim in it. What did the Urim and Thummim do? You remember? One was a stone of light and the other was a stone of truth. In uh, the ancient rabbinicals, it has when the early priest put that on, they didn't prophesy. Instead, they would literally listen and the illumination of God would come out of that and the voice of God would come out of the other stone and they would hear what God said through those two things. Matter of fact, all nations considered those two stones to be uh, the absolute epitome of any magic thing on earth because they knew that the voice of God and the light of God came out of those things. Even the Hebrews knew that. But they didn't consider it magic. They just considered it. Well, God decided to do that. Remember, that's right in the breastplate of the ephod. Now, God hadn't spoken to a priest in 200 years. Deborah was the last time he spoke. And then we got this little boy that's been serving him. And now he's turned 12 years old. Now, when you're 12 years old, you're supposed to go from your mother's care to your father's care. When he's 12 years old, all of a sudden he's laying in bed one night. One night, Eli's... He's quite old by this time. His eyes are recessed to the point he can't hardly see. Um, he's probably, I'm going to say, 93 at this time. Uh, he was 98 when he died, and uh, it's about three years after this fact. And Samuel, he was sleeping in his regular place, and it said he slept before the Lord. There's only one place. And one spot, because you weren't allowed to go into the holiest of holies, right? The priest was only allowed to go in once a year under penalty of death. Now, we, we know that uh, uh, there were some sins committed by two young boys that were in the priesthood. They decided they'd offer their own incense. And as a result, before that, man could have come before God in the priesthood any day, any night, any hour. Once they offered false incense the man was now cut off and the priesthood was limited that they could only come in once a year so we know that David is not laying in front of the ark or not David Samuel is not laying asleep in front of the ark right it's forbidden it's a penalty of death if he goes behind those curtains instead he's on this side tending the showbread tending the menorah tending the altar of incense which is our emotions our heart if he was sleeping before the Lord, guess where he was sleeping? The, the curtain, about as wide as that wall right there. Right in the very center was this altar of incense, golden altar of incense. Smoke would be having to come off of it all night long too, and all day. So that means somebody had to be carrying coals and somebody had to be carrying the right essence. If you're standing in front of that, Right on the other side of the curtain is the ark facing that curtain. And where Samuel slept was right at the foot of that curtain, right beside that golden altar. Now I'm telling you, even if you don't know God, if you get in service of him, you're going to get in closer and closer and closer until God himself begins to call you just because of your service to him. He served Eli for many, many years. And in his service to Eli, as he's sleeping there, tending Eli's duties. 
God says, Samuel. Samuel immediately gets up and runs to Eli. Yes, Master. Yes, Master. You'll find this in chapter 3 and 4. He comes to him three different times. He hears a voice. Now, Eli has never heard the voice of God, right? God stopped speaking to the priesthood. But because he wore the vestment, occasionally there was something from God that occurred. That occurred with Hannah. Matter of fact, when she was sitting at the table with Eli, when he finally found out she just wanted a child, he made a loud pronouncement, then let it be as you have said before the Lord. Uh, he's got on his stuff, you know. Guess what happened? She was blessed. Why? It needed to come that way. It needed to come through a blessing of the Lord, right? And the reason I'm, let me connect the dots for you. This is the guy that's going to anoint the Lord of our Lords. Did you know that? He's going to need a special breath from God to anoint the Lord of our Lords. He's going to need a special dispensation of the prophetic. He's going to need a special dispensation of a connection with God. Why he is the guy that's chosen to come and anoint, anoint the king that the Messiah's lineage would come out of. And in that anointing was an impartation from God, a heart of God, a mind of God, a thirst for God. There was a supernatural anointing that came forth, and every priest, and there was no prophet for 200 years, every priest was basically brain dead. No one could anoint nothing because there was no anointing that they were given. And so God had to raise up somebody that had an anointing in their life. And how did they get that anointing? Through their service to the Lord through being there before him in his house. And in the midst of that, God began to speak, and finally Eli says, you know, this, this could be a, God could be speaking to him, a kid. And then he, he yeah, he might, it must be him. It's not me. Three times he had to, no, no, I, I didn't say nothing. And then he really realized, I mean, this is really a slow high priest, right? Three times in the middle of the night, third time, uh, huh. Maybe, maybe, God's, maybe God's speaking. Is God speaking? Yeah. And he said, I tell you what, you just go back, and if you hear that again, say these words to him. And I find these probably the most significant words of our Christian life that we can come up with if we really want God to speak with us. Eli said, when you hear your name, say, Lord, speak your servant is listening. If you're not willing to be a servant to do what he says instantly, why would he speak to you? And because he recited the right words, speak, your servant is listening. God spoke prophetically for the first time in two years. And he said, little Samuel, I know you're 12 years old. I'm paraphrasing this for you. I'm sure he addressed those things. A kid would think, well, who might hear God, right? Matter of fact, if you heard God, you would expect you're probably going to have to die because you heard God. <laughs> if you knew anything about God back then, he was not a friendly guy. He was do it or die, right? Come on, was he? That, that was his nature. He wanted to put it on the table. I am God. I want to introduce you to fear so that you can fear me. Because one of the prerequisites for us to be able to approach him, hear him, know him, to hear his voice, you must have the fear of God within you. If you don't have the fear of God, you're not going to acquire what you need to get into his presence. It's the first prerequisite for 73 different things that has to do with us being able to connect with God. And if you don't have the fear of God in your heart, if you're not trembling, you're not going to see him. You're not going to be directed by him. There's Samuel. And God says, Samuel, I want you to tell Eli, I'll never accept any of his sacrifices. His lineage is done for. I'm paraphrasing this. You can read all the particulars about it. And he said, I, I, I want you to tell him I reject him. And I reject this nation for what they've done, said to me. And there's a long spill about it. And a little kid, he's holding all this information directly from God about what's going to happen, what's fixing to take place prophetically. And the next morning, I'm sure his eyeballs were about this big around. He's just shaking after that meeting. Would you be shaking after that meeting? Uh, and he's 12. He's 12. He just had an encounter with the living God. And he knows it's an encounter. And now Eli wakes up. Samuel, tell me, the Lord speak to you? Yes, Master. 
What do you say? Uh, don't want to say the other Samuel, if the Lord spoke to you, I tell you, if you don't tell me what he said, everything he said is going to come upon you and overtake you in your life. Now, <laughs> you're a 12-year-old kid. Are you between a rock and a hard place? And Samuel is willing to say, under those terms and conditions, everything that God said. And Eli said, let it be so, that is God. And God is good. He knew he had much more coming than what God said. This was the beginning of hearing God. And if we, in our prayer life, God doesn't come on our terms. We have to come on his terms. Our prayer life should be, here is your body. I thank you, my Lord Jesus, that you're living inside now. Here is your body. I present it to you. You use in service to me. And there, your prayer life is going to grow. Why? Because it's the only place that sets the right conditions for growth. Are you, I, I, I grant you, I've been to West Texas, and I've seen tumbleweeds, and they grow anywhere. They'll grow in the middle of the road if you give them a chance. But what good are they? And I can tell you many of the things we think we know about God were like a tumbleweed. We grew up real fast in the highway of life with a not a lot of knowledge about God and a few spiritual experiences and a few I command this to happen and I command like we're Jedi Knights. Remember I don't know, y'all see the Jedi Knights, you know? And they would try to repeat things in the wave of the hand and get somebody else that's weak-minded to do that. You know, we're, we're not. We're supposed to be his servants. And if we would just take that posture, we'll see the most awesome living God. And because Samuel continued to abide there, God spoke to him more and more and more. And by the time he's 12 to 15, he's known throughout all of the land of Israel, all the different towns, there's a, there's a kid who's hearing God. There's a prophet in our mission. He's a kid. It blew him away. I mean, all the tribes are always wrapped up about what wasn't God. and what. All of them agreed for the first time there's somebody that's from God. All of them agreed. There's, all the cities agreed. And boy, when he spoke it, God said... He didn't let one of his words fall to the ground. Not one. Why? Where was he sleeping? Who was he serving? Our respective hearing in our prayer life should be established in that inner sanctuary in the midst of God's purposes. Because I can tell you, most of our Christian purposes are, here's my laundry list, Lord. I'm in quite a hurry. Can you hurry up and fulfill this? Do you think that is going to fly before the living God? Do you think you're going to get launched into his presence with that type of attitude? It's not. It's one of servanthood. If we will be his servant, in the midst of being a servant, God fully empowered Samuel. That whatever Samuel spoke came to pass. But I guarantee you, he didn't speak anything out of his own flesh. He didn't speak anything out of his own power. He didn't speak anything out of his own mind. He only spoke that which he heard the Father speak. Jesus, in the midst of this, is still speaking. Jesus speaks to him and tells him, go anoint a king. People have rejected me. So I'm going to put a king over them. That king's going to bleed them. He's going to take their children. and He's going to make slaves out of their children. He's going to take the best of the land. He's going to take the best of their food. They said they wanted a king. They said they didn't want me. They want to be ruled like that. I'm giving them a king. Saul was established. God knew Saul would fail. And he has Samuel go anoint David. Why? Because he wanted people to get a taste of, oh, you just think things your way. You want someone who can beat off the enemy that keeps taking your stuff. But that someone that you want to rule... He's going to take your stuff. Why? Because God had a very wonderful relationship with the people at one time of him blessing the crops, of him walking throughout a land that belonged to him, of him multiplying it, him causing it to be fruitful, him causing it to be rich and robust with his presence coming forth and doing every manner of miracle. Can you imagine showing up as a people and finding a city like this size? 
all the houses, all the farms, all the dairies. There's no one there. What house do you want to live in? Oh, you want to be a dairy farmer? Well, there's, a, there's some cows out there that need milk. And, uh, uh, do you want that? The whole nation was given to them like that. I uh, grant you, they did fight some battles some places, but the rest of the place, the rest of the city, grapes, the vineyards, <coughs> all of those things, God had his enemies plant those in preparation for the people of God that would be arriving 400 years later. And the people that were there on God's land were trespassers, and they knew it was God's land. They knew he had a covenant with Abraham. They knew that he walked the length of the land. They were fearful of God, but they went ahead and tried to take his land. And he raised up a people, and now I'm giving it to them. And my whole point in giving you this is our, our communing with the Lord begins in our service of laying before Him, sleeping before Him, being in His house, being in His presence. In that, our prayer life begins to click. Do you think Samuel, out of service to the Lord, developed a personal prayer life of talking to God? He did. We see that time after time in all the great miracles that Sam, Samuel did. I would submit to you, take your life, go in and talk with Jesus and say, you know, I'm not letting you take this body and do what you want with it. I would like to enter into a new contract with you so that you can fulfill your covenant with the Father. I thank you for covering me. I thank you for waiting on me. I'm, I'm kind of retarded. I'm slow. Would you, would you please forgive me, O oh Lord? Instead, I want to begin to yield myself to you if you're willing to yield yourself to him for his use, he will speak to you and you will learn how to pray. You will learn how to pray. Elsewise, it's a forced effort on our part for what we can extract from him or what we can achieve from him and through him. Now, I've done Prayer 101 with you. I've done teachings. Probably somebody asked me the other day, I said, have you listened to the prayer season? I said, is that a really long one? <laughs> I said, well, I hope so. There's a lot to learning how to pray. There's a lot to being in God's presence. a lot to getting God to hear your prayers. Many people pray, but few people get God to hear their prayers. God wants us to be able to be heard before him. In Philippians, the Lord makes the statement, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord's near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, how many things? By prayer and petitions. Do you realize those are two different things? Prayer is me just talking with the Lord about it. Petitions means I have a hierarchy of what I want to talk about, that these are really important. See, Hannah came to him and she was, oh God, would you move? There's a prayer. Here's my petition. My womb is dry. Would you hear my petition? Oh, would you impregnate me? Would you, oh God, give me a child? Now the petition is rolling out of her tongue. But it began by deep, guttural prayer of the need that was in her life that was a real need. And then it goes on to say, after the petition, with thanksgiving. So it's given me three different forms of prayer in this one sentence. And I can tell you, most Christians I meet are ungrateful and unthankful for anything they have. All they want is give me, give me, give me more, more, more. We're supposed to be falling on our face and grateful that He's forgiven our sin. We're supposed to be falling on our face and grateful that He loves us. We're supposed to be falling on our face in gratefulness and thankfulness that you're covering my shame. As we are full of shame, if we were to stand before the glorious angels, we would see how polluted our minds are, how polluted our ways are, how we do not want to do things God's way, which brings great shame upon a body that's supposed to be belonging to Jesus. And when I come into that mindset and that understanding now, oh, I am so grateful, I am so thankful that you cover my shame. We're supposed to be thankful about it. His provision. We're supposed to be thankful about His love. We're supposed to be thankful that He laid his, laid his life down. We're supposed to be thankful that He is orchestrating my future. I'm thankful that He's orchestrating my future. And I want to do what He has for me to do, not what I want to do for myself. more I do for myself, the more I shame myself. The more I do for Him, the more He covers my shame. And then when I look at my unrighteous thoughts, oh my 
goodness. I said something the other day. I was at a kids' party a, a couple of days ago, and these little kids, and uh, there was a teacher there, and she was teaching them how to... Uh, uh, it, was, it was a house that was built like a ship, and so she was teaching them about knots and all that stuff, and she knew nothing about knots. And I'm the only male figure at this women's tea party. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> And she said, do you know anything about knots? Can you teach them how to tie knots? Said, well, sure, you know. I went in, tied knots, and had fun with kids and interacted and all that stuff. And, you know, and the kids were just absolutely amazingly obedient. They, they, they were running and whizzing around this place. And it was absolutely delightful to watch them. And I was excited and made a lariat and showed them how to do the lariat and slip knots and bowling and half bowlings and all this stuff, you know, sailor knots and all that stuff. And they had pictures of those. And, and uh, one of the mothers afterwards, she said, oh, that's so exciting. They're learning to tie knots. And I said, yes, I just hope they don't go tie the teacher up now. And I thought, you know, that was funny. But, oh, Lord, I just disdain the kid's character. A little bit of shame came out of me about my humorous statement. And I can tell you all the way home I wanted to cry because I had said that about somebody's children. When those children were absolutely perfect children. But there's things we say that are degrading. There's things we say that if we're close to the Spirit, the Lord says, Oh, why did you say that? Because it was not His voice. I could have said something from His voice. And so ever since then, I've been praying about him covering my shame, praying that that would not remain in that mother's mind or that mother's heart. What possessed me to say such a thing? Now, you might say, well, that was a light thing. If I'm walking with Jesus, it caused him to wince and stand back. It was not a light thing. And so I've been on my knees and trembling every sense of crying out, Lord, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, come and cover my shame. Once again, I've said one more thing in front of somebody on this earth that was not right. And there are so many witnesses on earth that have heard me say things that aren't not right. If we were to line up all the witnesses of all the things we've said and thought and done, our shame would become plain to us. And we would have a reason to ask for his, for his forgiveness. And we would have a reason to be thankful, O oh Lord, that you're willing to cover my shame. I won't even talk about some of the deep, dark things that I've done in times past. That one's deep enough because it caused the Lord to wince. Now, so this won't be a long message. How about we finish this one passage of Scripture? I'm laughing. Y'all not. What does that mean? Mm. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is there. And don't be anxious about anything, but in everything in prayer and petition with, and with thanksgiving, present your request. God, if you're presenting a request, that means there's a ceremony now that's been arranged that you can present something before living God. It's no longer just a petition. A petition is not a request. A petition is something that's written down that will maybe be reviewed before a great queen or a great, great king. But a request, you got an audience with a king. We, we missed that in the verbiage, but that, 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 was, that was what was going on back then. And he said, now, make your request. Present your request. How can we present a request to God if it's only our laundry list. If I'm his servant, I have access in standing before him to make that request. If I'm not his servant, his way, I'm not in the inner sanctuary to be able to make the request. The most I can do is pray and have petitions and maybe a little thanksgiving. But I can tell you the closer I get in that inner sanctuary, I see more of my need I see more of my failings, which makes me that much more grateful and that much more thankful. 
I would submit to you if you can make it and be the servant in the inner sanctuary and see the light of the Spirit, you will become so grateful and so thankful because you can see what God is doing for you. In the midst of that, he says, when you're doing these things, he says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. The word peace, shalom, I've told you this a million times, is God picking up his baton as an orchestra leader, telling everybody to turn to their perspective right page and making all events play according to what he wants done. If I'm willing to play second violin or even my little triangle. His way, he gives me a sheet of music. And he says, if you will learn to pray this way, then I, the God of peace, will bring peace to you. Remember we talked about all the circumstances that surround us. Did You need those circumstances to begin to obey him. If you become his servant and make your body available now, because you're willing to play his music his way at his time, he's willing to take up the baton and begin to make all those circumstances play in accordance with his will. You can fight the circumstances or you can fight the flesh and become a servant. If you become a servant and you learn to talk to him, he will orchestrate. He will become the God of peace that transcends all understanding. See, all I can understand, the alligators are eating me. They're halfway up to my navel. <laughs> it's all I can understand, Lord. He says, ah, oh, you need me to speak to that alligator? <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> need me to get him off of you? Yes, Lord. Then let me give you peace of mind, that I will do that. My peace will transcend the understanding of the alligator eating me. It will get me out of the mouth of the alligator. God's peace in my life will do that for me. I need his peace in my life, and I cannot get that unless, one, I become a servant, and two, I learn how to pray his way. can't pray authorized prayers that are answerable in the flesh. Last passage of scripture that I think I want to give you. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Isaiah 58 and 9. Then you will call upon the Lord and he will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, Here I am if you do away with the yoke of oppression. Now he's involved other people. I hate it when he involves other people. I was doing fine until he wanted me to apologize to that person. <laughs> you know, if I don't have to do anything, I'm fine. But if I have to do something, that's a problem. He says, if you do away with the yoke of oppression and with the pointing finger and with malicious talk. And I can tell you in charismatic cir circles, malicious talk is the destroyer of God's power being released in our presence was it not in the days of Moses when it was in the days of Moses the people murmured against everything God's leader said and as a result of murmuring they just wondered and we will be wonderers if there's malicious talk there cannot be malicious talk there must be a ceasing of all malicious talk if we're willing to do these things then God will teach us his ways what good does it do for him to show me his ways if I make it into the inner sanctuary and I walk out and I, did you know so-and-so they didn't do this? I, I think they should have. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, is he going to hear me when I go back in? I'm not supposed to talk about you. I'm supposed to serve him. And my whole point in being is, remember I talked about that cockpit of the F-20 it had all kinds of dials in it that made it operate. Our life of faith has all kinds of dials in it, all kinds of instrumentation, and all kinds of training that we need to be able to learn how to get into flight. If you can learn those things God's way, your life can be a life of faith in His presence. 
I meet many people that want a life of faith so they can command things to happen. I live a life of faith because I want it as present. I don't want anything else. I just want this present. Because out of that come the manifestation of his glory, the manifestation of his spirit, the manifestations of his power, the manifestations of him doing what he wills. And guess what? I get to be used as an instrument in the midst of that sometime. I pray and hope that you become his instrument. It's not just a simple Cessna 150. That cannot get you in the stratosphere. It does not have the defensive capability it needs. It does not have the radar. It does not have all the instrumentation. God's ways will give us an ability to be able to get into his presence. But where do you train to get in the cockpit? Right in the sanctuary and serving him. Become his servant. Love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. Render and surrender your life to him. You will not be disappointed in the amount of verbiage that he has to speak to you. You will not have to cry out and say, speak to me. If you become that servant and you learn to live in his presence, you'll be overwhelmed with what he has to say. In the conversations between Samuel and God, we have no discourse from Samuel. We only have a discourse from God. Which would you rather hear, what you have to say to God or what he has to say to you? Become his servant. He has much to teach you, much to instruct you. He wants you to walk in his presence. Shall we bow our hearts in prayer? Lord, how gracious you are, Lord, to give us invitation. And to just put it in simple terms, it is not hard. There's no child of yours that can't learn to do things your way. And you're willing to tolerate us lighting the candles backwards and doing things for a season backwards. But Lord, shouldn't there come a time that we gain maturity and leave the elementary teachings and let us go on, oh Lord. Go on and walk with you and live in your presence. Touch us in our hearts and minds that we would desire to accomplish stuff and such and give us confidence that it can be accomplished. There are instructions for these things. Help us receive those. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name I pray. Amen. 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 Before we dismiss, I uh, think that uh, Elton is having some problems this morning and his wife. Can we extend our hands? They live Camino Island that way. Lord, we bring Elton and Terry to you this morning. We know his body was nearly challenged unto death last year and even the year before. And her body has nearly been challenged unto death. And we cry out to you as their brothers and sisters. We cry out to you. And we pray and we come and we lift up our petitions to you that you would grant recovery, that you would grant healing, that you would send ministering angels with great power and a decree of healing to overtake them. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name I pray. Would you extend your hands this way? Uh, Jereen somehow fell and she, she has a concussion and she needs God's intervention. Lord, I, I bring my precious sister's dream to you this morning. I ask you, Lord, that you would bring healing to her brain. I ask you, Lord, you'd bring healing to the skull. I ask you, you would relieve the pressure and cause the pressure not to have done any damage to the brain. Would you, O oh Lord, overshadow her with your wing? Would you cover her with your presence? Would you cover her with your greatness? And would you bring healing and cause it to overtake her? In Jesus' great and precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, richly bless you. If anyone needs prayer, be glad to lay hands upon you and pray for you. You're dismissed. And if y'all could fellowship back there where the voices are not heard too much down here, uh, we would appreciate that. That means you can go.